Thank you so much uh, for uh, the uh, wonderful entertainment. And I, uh, I want you to know that it is with great pride uh, that I introduce to you our special guest uh, for um, this session. He is our 41st governor of the state of Minnesota, Governor Timothy Walls. I know a lot of you know a lot about the background of our governor, but I wanna just share a few things with you. Prior to serving as the governor of the great state of Minnesota, Governor Walls was Minnesota's United States representative for the from the first congressional district, a position that he held from 2007 to 2019. The congressional district includes the cities of Rochester, Austin, Winona, and Mankato, just in case you didn't know your Minnesota geography. Prior to being elected to Congress, uh, Governor Walls was a public school teacher for 20 years. He has spent um, a long lot time serving as a, a public leader. On May 26, 2020, the day after the killing of George Floyd, Governor Walls responded to his death by ordering the Minnesota State Legislature to reconvene for a special session on legislation for police reform and accountability. After police reform bill uh, failed to pass in the first session in June, a second special session was held in July. And on July 21st, the Minnesota State Legislature passed major police reform legislation. The new law includes a limited ban on the use of chokehold restraint, on warrior training, and also created a unit at the BCA, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, for the investigation of fatal police encounters and a community relations advisory council to consult with the post board on additional policy changes. These were critical first steps that are foundational, foundational to reimagining an equitable and just response to criminal justice reform. Governor Walls, I wanna thank you for your leadership and I invite all of our guests today at our conference to welcome, join me in welcoming Governor Tim Walls. Good afternoon, everyone. Mayor Sells Belton, thank you for the, the kind invitation. It is, a, uh, it is a true privilege for me to be introduced by you, uh, someone who uh, I am grateful to be able to call a friend, someone who has been a role model for so many of us uh, in elected office and uh, a true confidant who always speaks truth to power and I, I can count on uh, to give unvarnished advice on, on some of the toughest subjects. Um, to each of you, Thank you for the work that you're doing and, and thank you for taking the time. Um, 2020 has taken so much from us. Uh, it's taken our ability to gather together. Um, it's also taken Tom Johnson from us. And um, for many of you, uh, Tom's work is foundational to reimagining how we see justice. I also think for me, I got a chance to know Tom later in my life. Um, Tom was the inspiration for me to start understanding more and, and, and walking in others' footsteps um, to understand what we needed to do um, as a teacher um, and then as a congressman and now as the privilege of serving as governor. Uh, Tom's legacy is immense. Um, it shapes a lot of the thinking and the actions that our administration and many of you take in building with the other giants who are on this call. I would also note that uh, Tom's legacy um, continues uh, through his children. Uh, for some of you who may not know, uh, Kayla Johnson Castaneda is a senior um, advisor in our office. She possesses all of Tom's intelligence, his compassion, his innovative spirit, and his humor. And um, I, for one, am grateful for Tom and the work he's done around reimagining justice. And I'm grateful for the family that uh, carries on his legacy. Well, for each of you, and as the mayor said, um, that afternoon of May 25th, um, and watching as the world watched, as George Floyd's life was extinguished in front of us in the most callous and 
almost clinical manner, emotions erupted. Um, the primal scream for justice that was heard around the world came out of that. But there were also numerous people who told me and said things well-meaning and said uh, that that's when the day that Minnesota's innocence died at 38th in Chicago. Well, Minnesota's innocence had been gone for an awful long time, um, dating back to founding. Um, and, and folks on this call understand that those systemic inequities and racial injustices that permeate everything is one of the reasons someone would say that is well-meaning and even in a compassionate tone and miss what, what George Floyd's death meant. Some of you might have seen, because it was on live national television, I was approached by a reporter who had been arrested in the, the chaos after, after the killing. And that reporter, a black reporter, and, and I will leave it for you to decide um, whether that was inadvertent or what, it didn't matter. And I was apologizing to that reporter on behalf of the state of Minnesota for, for that arrest. But he also asked a very simple question, what now? And simple, yes, difficult answer. Um, but I answered in that moment, and I would answer it the same way today, that we either start and make real, measurable, effective change around racial inequities, around healthcare disparities, around economic inequities, and around criminal justice, or we're not gonna get another shot at it. And, and I say we in Minnesota, because what was torn back on that afternoon and the, and, and the subsequent days afterwards was a system that had people in Minnesota surprised that this type of thing happened or couldn't understand while I was asking for and others were asking for for an awful long time a posthumous pardon uh, of Max Nason, an innocent black man who was lynched in front of 10,000 folks in Duluth in 1920. And the power that came out of recognize that and granting the state's first posthumous pardon in our state's history and having one of the people speak in the name of that pardon being the police chief of Duluth, whose ancestor was the one who brought the false charge against Max Nathan. So with that backdrop and 2020's relentless COVID-19 marching through our communities, someone else told me, again, well-meaning, but it shows you why we have so much work to do. They said, boy, COVID-19 is the great equalizer. COVID-19 is not the great equalizer. It's the great unequalizer you're two times more likely to get sick and end up in intensive care if you're black in Minnesota than if you're not from COVID-19. You're many times more likely to lose your job. You're much more likely to be on the edge of eviction because of inequities around home ownership and actual uh, generational wealth. All of those things have come together to make what you're doing today and over the next several days more important than it's ever been. As I spoke on that street at 38th in Chicago, we're not gonna get another chance. Legislators and the people of color and indigenous caucus, which is growing. And as it grows, it starts to look and represent more like Minnesota, let it charge. As Mayor Sellis Belton said, to make some meaningful reforms. But imagine us being pleased that in the summer of 2020, after George Floyd was choked to death on the streets, that we're patting ourselves on the back because we banned chokeholds. That ought to show you what the amount of work that needs to be done. But the good news is the capacity to do it sets amongst the folks on this call. The capacity to do it sets amongst the tens of thousands of peaceful protesters who were on the streets of Minneapolis and St. Paul and Washington DC and Berlin across the world as they were looking at us. And while we did make progress, it was not nearly enough. And so I would ask you today, against the backdrop of COVID-19 pandemic that is ravaging 
our communities of color that is the potential to be one of the single greatest public health catastrophes in this nation's history and probably will be. As we sit here today, the infection rates and hospitalization rates are higher in the upper Midwest than at any place on the planet at any time during this pandemic. For all of our wealth and for all of our scientific breakthroughs and for all of our belief that we could somehow get this stuff right, we have failed more miserably than any country on earth. And those most impacted by it are the folks that are always most negatively impacted by it when we make these types of decisions. And so the things that we can control, now is our time to control them. The areas that we can make progress in, we either make it or we face the facts that it's never going to happen. I truly believe that. I'm the eternal optimist. You heard Merritt Self Belton tell you, my training is as a public school teacher. And I'll tell you what, um, being in those public schools and seeing, depending on where you live geographically, seeing the differences in the resources, seeing the differences in the funding mechanisms, seeing the differences in what the teachers look like in those schools, whether it was my time on Pine Ridge teaching or my time in Mankato. And so our call to action amongst our administration is we know there's much more to be done. And I would just tell you um, the vision that this organization and the folks on here and the researchers that are here and the practitioners that are on here and our administration of, of putting people like Paul Snell at the Department of Corrections or Daniel Karpowitz, folks that have a vision that things can be different. And my expectation is, is for the new legislature to come right back where we were, because I think there's a lot of people feel like they're the pat on the back and they've moved on and we did some of this change and that's it. There is so much more work to be done. We'll be introducing once again, as we pushed a juvenile justice act reform, raising the age of delinquency, um, ending the medieval Byzantine practice of shackling juveniles and adding to a trauma that's already there. That needs to move. It needs to move because every single person on this call knows is that incarceration is a failure of the system. When we get to that point, we have failed at every step along the way. And most of the outcomes after incarceration do not end well. So we do have to tackle what's there. And that issue around incarceration, we need to make sure that we're person-centered and community-driven with a clear understanding that these folks are going to all be back out, the vast majority, and they need to be contributing members of that community. And they need to be seen by that, not only through their own vision and their own lived experiences, but by their neighbors. And that means us preparing them to do that. That means us preparing all along the way. It means thinking about the moment that a person steps into incarceration that we're already thinking about that end state of where they are back into a different spot. And that doesn't happen in the last three months. It doesn't happen with assigning a case manager after none of these things have been thought through. And it doesn't mean that we're going to ignore the massive disparities of trying to find housing or trying to find work or whatever else is those barriers that are thrown up. So our I would say goal, but I think we need to challenge ourselves publicly and much more. Our charge and our commitment is to move these pieces of reforms and to move them in concert with other issues that we know are holding folks back. Again, some of you have heard me say this and, and George Floyd didn't, it wasn't the start of that. And, and again, I wanna be very clear, so many people who have been impacted by this, I, I think about this and the names we don't know if we don't hear the names, uh, Delshia Perry's son died in the Beltrami County Jail, not by being knelt on for eight minutes and 46 seconds, but he was left to die on the floor for eight days. Eight days. And Delshia, Pia, Delshia Perry's work has made us reevaluate how do we inspect county jails? Who's held, who's held accountable for that? How do we make sure that the things that we're doing why were they in jail for eight days in county jail to begin with? All of the disparities. Cities are tackling these issues. They're tackling the issues of cash bail. 
and financial disparities. Again, we'll beat COVID at some point, but those inequities were already there. All of those health inequities and all of those social determinants of healthcare were there. To not address them, the moral failure is obvious, but if it takes more motivation for people, the economic failure is absolutely destroying our opportunities. We know in this state, employers know in this state, that 70% of our workforce is gonna come from communities of color over the next 20 years. What are we gonna do about it? What are we going to do to make sure that the skill sets are there? Um, we've convened, and I'll be joining them this afternoon, um, a panel of our leaders from Justice Allen Page um, to other community leaders to challenge me as a public school teacher of someone who spent my life in this. What is education gonna look like in Minnesota going forward? Is it gonna be more patting on the back that our white kids get the best public school education in the country and our black students get the, bat, the, get the worst? Those are things that we have to, uh, we have to tackle. Um, I don't think this is gonna be easy. Um, I've never been under that illusion. I certainly don't think I'm right. I certainly think there's folks on here that given the opportunity face-to-face -face, would call out the failures of our administration at this point, and I would gladly own them. What I know and what I knew on that street in the days after George Floyd's killing is, it's either now or the status quo will prevail. I could not have anticipated the amount of division that we're now seeing in our country. Not the level of it, I certainly could have anticipated it. I talked about when I asked to be governor that we needed to see ourselves as one Minnesota because I saw people using terms like we need to protect our way of life under the assumption that someone else's way of life isn't quite as valuable or that there's a war on greater Minnesota and the Twin Cities. Just to be very clear, those are manufactured by people who know the oldest trick in the book is to divide us along lines that are easily seen but more difficult to heal. And this issue that started to come up and we started to make progress on, on justice reform is going to challenge us in a way that we haven't been challenged in Minnesota. It's going to make us come back and approach this through our values. It's going to, as we've said in our administration, try and view every issue through a lens of equity and try to be called on it. Whether that is equity in the construction of a freeway or equity on how we do bonding. For the first time in the state of Minnesota's history, we ask that there be a clause on equity and bonding on who gets the money for the state of Minnesota. And lo and behold, it's big front page news and a pat on the back that Hmong farmers are going to be able to get a bonding loan, a bonding piece to them so that they can actually buy their land. Every single person on this call understands what generational wealth means and they watched it get wiped out on Lake Street. They watched it get wiped out in the end of May and the end of June. And now they're watching as both state and federal government won't even fund the money to clean up the rubble, let alone rebuild. And how many people are waiting to swoop in and take that land and take that gentrification to another level? And there went generations of holding on. So we understand, and again, I wanna be clear, and, and, and I fully expect to be called out on this and I fully expect to fail you. So how do we reimagine justice with folks who want to believe that the entire problem that happened at the end of May is someone started a fire? Yeah, that's a problem, but that's not the foundational problem. That fire would have never been started had George Floyd not had his life snuffed out. That fire would have never been started if Minnesota didn't have inequities in education that are epic, that are absolutely atrocious. All of those things, home ownership, business ownership, all of those types of things. So it starts with having that vision. It starts with us figuring out how do we bring compassion and how do we bring a sense of humility? And again, it's not lost on me to all of you on here, a white man from greater Minnesota, that, yes, that's a pers that is a perspective that walk in those shoes looks a lot different than someone else. But I'm here to tell you, 
it's going to take each and every one of us. It's going to take the white man from greater Minnesota to understand what happened in Minneapolis was not chaos and rioting by people who don't care. It was a primal scream for justice who want it done. And it's an understanding that these injustices are exacerbated the further you get from the Twin Cities. That's where we start to see this, whether it be a survivor, a victim, or a perpetrator, however you view it, it's destroying cities and it's destroying our fabric across the state of Minnesota. So when we talk about reimagining, the hard part about this is we have got to be focused on results too. We have got to be focused on measurable things that get us to the place that we want to get to. And that part I can tell you is hard. And I have asked my administration to not shy away from the metrics of measurable. I took it with this idea of housing and housing inequities. And we started with veterans. And the reason that we started with veterans is because they come with a set of support that we know tackles that issues of homelessness. They have access to healthcare, they have access to job training, and they have some of those skill sets. But I looked at this, that we're saying it and measuring it. We are going to functionally eliminate veterans homelessness. I've got 308 in Minnesota that are still not housed. We need to approach this issue of justice reform with the same sense of metrics and expectations that we can get there. If we allow a nebulous, we're gonna do better, we're gonna do this, it's not going to get there. We are going to have to show it. We're going to have to prove it. And we're going to have to own up that we're going to fail at times. And I'm telling you, government agencies are not built to fail correctly. We do, we fail, but in business, there's that old adage, uh, fail fast and pivot and try something else and try and innovate. We're not given that opportunity. And right now in criminal justice here in Minnesota, we've had a bright light shined on what everybody on this call knew ahead of time, that we either make these changes now or the profound impact across all sectors of society is going to be felt from here on out. But the good news is there's enough committed people there's enough of a sense of enough is enough that they saw on the streets of Minneapolis, that they see in the Beltrami County Jail, that they see every single day, that we have a responsibility that those of us, if we were in elected office or we're grass top leaders or we're leading NGOs, my statement on there is we need to move. We need to move as quickly as we can. And we need to move with a deliberate focus on results that return the types of behaviors, the types of society, and the types of opportunities that our children deserve to, because that's really what it's about. We are accountable to them. So. I wanna thank each of you. I wanna thank Tom Johnson um, in front of all of you for helping influence me, for showing me the road and it's a long one and I have a lot to learn, um, but the willingness to try, to try and to reimagine justice in a different way. And in the short opportunity that I'm given by the people of Minnesota to be in a position where I can make a small influence I have a responsibility to do all I can. I lean to the folks on this call. I look to the leadership of folks who have walked this for many, many years. And I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that we find a place in a very divided, in a very toxic uh, social, uh, social setting across the country right now, politics and everything aside, that we're able to find a place where we can start to get those answers. So um, I wish you the best in the rest of your conference. Um, I'm grateful. I think the feedback that we receive, um, we, we take it and try and do our best. And as I said, I have a responsibility to answer for the things that the state of Minnesota does. Sometimes that answer will not make you happy. Um, but what I hope you always know, it's always grounded in the sense 
that we have to make sure that equity is at the center of what we do. We have to make sure that restorative justice is the air that we're breathing. And we have to make sure that everyone, everyone is a part of what it takes to solve this. So thank you all and um, enjoy the rest of your day.